And we are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the fourth feature presentation of Wakelet Community Week 2022. I hope everybody has your popcorn with you today because this one is going to be an absolute blockbuster. We'll shortly be joined by the EdTech wizard himself, the founder of the Ditch That Textbook movement, Matt Miller. As many of you know, Matt has written a number of game-changing books and continues to be one of the most active and influential figures in EdTech. So the team here at Wakelet is absolutely privileged to have him join us again for another Wakelet Community Week keynote session. Of course, we live in a world where we have a lot of apps and channels all battling for the attention of our students. So it can be really difficult to help them to engage when it comes to education. And that's why this session is going to be really useful for everybody, regardless of the grade that you teach. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Matt to the screen so that he can explain his concept of the attention switch. Hey, Matt, how's it going? Hey, good. Thanks so much for having me. I'm pumped to, to get to speak with you all about this. Absolutely, yeah. I'm sure I can speak for the, everyone in the chat that I'm really, really excited to see what you have to present for us today. And I encourage everybody that's joining us live to drop an introduction for yourselves in the chat, uh, get it going, get the hype building. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm sure feel free to ask them there and we can go back to them at the end of Matt's session. Uh, but I think we should jump straight in. Matt, it's over to you. Yeah, absolutely. So, urinals and toilet stalls have something to teach us about teaching. Now seriously, go with me on this. Sometime in the last 10 or 15 years, they've started letting something into restrooms that had almost always been banned before. Have you noticed it? Do you know what it is? Advertisements. See, advertisers were getting desperate. Traditional advertising had worked for ages. Billboards, newspaper ads, magazine ads, TV commercials. But then this innovation came along and wrecked all of their best laid plans. The smartphone. It was a constant distraction from their attention-based advertising. And people carried them around in their pockets and they would just look at them whenever they got bored or in the minds of the advertisers at the exact time when they should have been looking at advertisements instead. So it was time to get creative. Advertisers started buying and placing ads in restrooms, right above the urinals in the men's rooms and on the doors of toilet stalls. Can you remember the first time you saw one of these? At first, they just started placing regular ads in the restrooms, but then advertisers started getting creative in their messaging. First, it was the wording that they used. Can you see it? Stream, squat. Then they started targeting where the bathroom was located. This ad at a theater, this one's an old one, is about blockbuster online DVD rentals. Yes, I said blockbuster. And it says, at home, you could have pressed pause. This beer ad actually was placed inside of a urinal. And it made it look like the urinal was cracked. When we say strong beer, we mean it. These brawn ads are actually mirrors. Don't shave it, style it. And you can check out the different beard and mustache styles while you go. Brand cereal. <laughs> Do you get it? And then there's the obstacle course. Mini Cooper, can you maneuver around the cones? See, restroom advertising works. It's effective. Why? Because you're a captive audience. They know that your eyes are going to be fixed in that one spot for a short period of time. But even toilet stalls weren't safe from the reach of the smartphone. Did you know people actually use their phones in there? A survey found that 80% of men and 69% of women use their phone on the toilet. And most report that they're checking social media, followed closely by messaging, listening to music, and watching videos. Notice that reading restroom advertising was not on that list. The point is that 
restroom advertising worked. Restroom advertising captured your attention until it didn't. See, even restroom advertisements have fallen prey in this battle for your attention. Cell phones buzz and ding all day, begging us to look at them. Social media is designed to keep our eyes on it and our fingers scrolling. It's hard for advertisers to keep our attention, but they don't have it as hard as we educators, right? It's infinitely harder for us to command attention. Our students are conditioned to get instant gratification, instant messages, cell phone notifications, ding, 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 buzz, buzz, buzz. They have constant stimulus, you know, so they don't get bored. I mean, we didn't have cell phones to look at in the bathroom when we were kids. We were forced to look at the back of the toothpaste tube or the shampoo bottle. If you know, you know, right? Attention is a hard thing to capture in the classroom these days. Even on your best days, I bet you've seen this with students. Students come into class and they find their seats and they get settled in. They're still a little chatty, but they might still be energetic and class starts and things are going well. They're smiling. Well, some of them might be smiling and they're paying attention. Again, some of them. And then all of a sudden, it's like the power goes out. It's like someone flipped a switch and suddenly their attention is gone. You can scramble to get it back, but on most days, no matter what you do, you can't get their attention back. It was as if someone flipped a switch, right? See, I believe that all of us have a switch, an attention switch. And when that switch is turned on in our students, magic happens. Students are engaged and they're thinking and laughing and connected. When the attention switch is on, learning is easy. It doesn't feel like work at all. But when that attention switch is turned off, Students may still be there in person. They're still in their seats, but their attention is gone. They might as well be someplace else. They're disconnected, much like the electrical current is disconnected from the lights when we turn the light switch off. You can actually see students' attention switches turn off. Have you ever seen this before? Because on some days, student attention turns off like the lights in a skyscraper at the end of a workday because you see one student's attention go off and then another and then another and another until eventually the whole building is dark. On other days, student attention disappears like a massive power outage, like the whole grid just goes dark at the same time. And no matter how many times you try to flip that switch, those lights are not coming back on. You need electricity to make the lights come on. Ah, yes, electricity. Attention is the electricity that powers our classrooms. How can we flip the attention switch? How can we keep the attention switch turned on when students come in our class? And once it's been turned off, how can we do the even harder task of flipping the attention switch back on again? I have a few ideas, and I'll bet you do too. Now, I learned an important lesson about the attention switch when the students in my high school Spanish classes were all excited about this new social media platform. Do any of you remember Vine? Write it in the comments if you remember Vine. What do you remember about it? Now, if you're not familiar, Vine featured these six second looping videos. The creators were called Viners and they would make these creative short form videos that would play over and over and over and over again. Vine, Vine was the predecessor to TikTok. Like 
Vine was TikTok's grandma, okay? Vine was TikTok's grandma. You want a good idea of what Vine was like? Here, take a look. Michael, get up and get ready for school. No, I don't want to go, no. Please, mama, don't make me go. And they were roommates. Oh my God, they were roommates. LeBron James, LeBron James, LeBron James, LeBron James, LeBron James. Story time. Little did she know the mysterious figure creeping up behind her. <laughs> <laughs> Story time. Here she comes, the queen, able to kill men with a single stare. Sure, watch out, honey. <laughs> Story time. No matter how fast he ran, he could not escape the demon, but he would not let his soul be taken today. <laughs> Story time. In every group of friends, there's the dumb one. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Story time. It was common law that a flower be presented to the loveliest oh, lass. Well, and of course that's me. <laughs> Story time. And that's when they became horribly lost. Are we lost? No. He lied. Stop it. <laughs> Story time. She stared at the gown and thought, yes, this is something my husband would wear. Story time. It was clear that a romance was blossoming between them. No! A romance lasting a lifetime. Story time. The lad decided to do the honorable thing and share his treat with mother. <gasps> oh. <laughs> okay. So, as you can see, Vine was kind of like, all that my students were talking about at the time. And they made some videos, some of the time. But they were more of what you'd call lurkers than actual creators. I listened to their excited chatter about Vine one day before class, and for the first time it dawned on me, if this is what they're excited about, can I make use of it in class somehow? Have you ever asked yourself that before? If kids are excited about this, can I use it in class? I wrestled with this question for a bit. Using Vine in class, I mean, I could ask them to get the app on their phones. And the terms of use stated that my students had to be 17 years or older to use that social media app. <laughs> terms of use, like that ever stopped a kid from getting social media, right? But the terms were 17, and I wasn't going to require that. But even if I did, grading those assignments on Vine was going to be a bear. Finding those videos on each student's profile and watching them, providing feedback, there just there had to be a better way. So I thought about it for a little while, and I came up with an idea. The bell rang, and as class started, I told my students, we're going to be making Vines today. There was an awkward moment of confused silence as they looked at each other. It was as if their faces were saying, this doesn't make any sense. We're not supposed to use our phones in class. And besides, teachers hate social media. So they finally asked me, Mr. Miller, are you really gonna let us make vines? And I said, yes, sort of. <laughs> See, we had a handful of iPads to use in classroom, in the classroom, and that day, we made vocabulary vines. Students picked out vocabulary words, and in groups, they recorded six-second videos to illustrate those vocabulary words. And when we finished, they just watched each other's videos. It wasn't flawless, but it was a success. And the students were into it because it felt just enough like vine to do the trick. The attention switch was definitely turned on for the day. Now, like I said earlier, we didn't use the Vine app, but it felt like Vine, you know? It was a similar experience to Vine. Similar enough that it must have triggered the same part of those kids' brains that Vine triggered. What was the essence of the Vine experience? The thing that hooked those students in? It was expressing ideas in short video clips, six seconds long. I didn't need an app for that. I mean, they could record six second videos on the devices they already had. It wasn't the exact same experience, but it was close enough that it felt like they were creating vines. Here's what I realized that day. Make learning feel like what kids love. Make learning feel like what kids love. 
if students love something, and we can like make learning feel a little bit like it, it changes how they feel about the learning. You don't need Vine to make learning feel like Vine. This is what my book, Tech Like a Pirate, is all about. And a key concept to flipping the attention switch in our classrooms. See, we're not really changing what students are learning. We're changing how they experience the learning, right? They experience it in the same way they experience their favorite games or apps or books or shows. The learning feels the same as something they love, so they start to love the learning in the same way. Instead of asking, how can I teach vocabulary? We're asking, how can I teach vocabulary so it feels like mine? Let's say you're teaching freshman English and you're studying Romeo and Juliet. I mean, we usually tell students to write down what they remember in a document or fill in a worksheet. Instead, what if we did something like this? Example one, Snapchat. Do your students love Snapchat? I bet some of them do. There are lots of Snapchat filter games and they can make for fun learning activities. For instance, you could pose a discussion question from Romeo and Juliet as a this or that game, like they play with their friends on Snapchat. And the best part is you don't even need the Snapchat app. That what you see on your screen is just a simple Google Slides template that lets them choose between two options and then explain their answer at the bottom. And of course, you can take those images, download those images, and stick them in a Wakelet collection. See, you don't need Snapchat for learning to feel like Snapchat. Example two, Instagram. Do they watch or create Instagram stories? I bet some of them do. Turn your next writing prompt into a series of images and videos, just like Instagram stories. Imagine them responding to a prompt like this. What would Juliet's Instagram story look like from act two, scene two of Romeo and Juliet? Quite a prompt, right? Example three, Amazon. Have your students bought something on Amazon or at least look for products on there? I can almost guarantee that they have. Now, as you do searches on Amazon, Amazon learns what you like and it suggests products to you based on your activity, right? Students can show what they've learned by designing an Amazon homepage for a character, complete with an explanation of why certain items are displayed. So for instance, students could create Juliet's Amazon homepage and explain why Amazon would promote certain items on her homepage based on what they read in the story. And again, when they're done, download that as an image, stick it into a Wakelet collection. By the way, if you like all these examples and you'd like to use some of them in your own class, just hang on. I've got something for you. So what are we doing here exactly? Are we asking students to sign up for Snapchat? Are we coding or creating apps or designing video games? Are we doing something that's way above our, our tech ability level? No, we're storytelling. We're telling a new story with the same content that we've always had. We're taking the exact same learning activity we've always done. Then we're just looking at it through the lens of Snapchat, Instagram, Amazon, things that students love. And this isn't just for apps and technology. It goes for fashion, fitness, theater, sports, movies, cooking, anything that students love. What's trending in the minds of your students? What are your students in love, in, in love with right now? See if learning in your classroom can feel like it. You don't have to use the app and you don't even have to be an expert at it at all. But when students love something and when learning feels like what they love, they start to love the learning in the same way that they love what they love. Now, hopefully you're getting a grasp of this idea of the attention switch. It's a pretty simple one. Attention is the electricity that drives learning in our classroom. And the attention switch determines whether that electricity is flowing. 
And when it's on, learning doesn't feel like work at all. It can even feel like fun. But when the attention switch is off, students are disconnected and they might as well be someplace else. Now, after my experiment with vocabulary vines, I tried to flip the attention switch more and more. I started to have questions. You know, I needed to make sure that this wasn't too good to be true. Because it kind of sounded a little too good to be true. You know, pay, take what it is that kids love and help learning feel like it. Like, I needed to take an honest, critical look at this whole idea. And you might be like this too. You might be thinking, this attention switch thing sounds great in theory, but it just sounds a little too good to be true. For instance, on some days, when I attempted to flip the attention switch and engage my students, I felt more like a trained monkey than an educator. Can you sympathize with this? You know, one of those little monkeys that'll work a crowded street or a plaza doing tricks and trying to collect money for its owner, I would think, it feels just like I'm, I'm, I'm just entertaining them. It's just like that monkey would. But I'm an educator, and it isn't my job to entertain them. It's my job to teach them. And that's true. You know, entertainment isn't my job. But connection is. It is my job to connect with them as a person, to understand who they are as people, you know, to understand what makes my students tick, what motivates them, what drives them. It's also my job to connect them to what they're supposed to learn, to connect the dots and to make it all make sense, to help everything fall together so that my students can use what they've learned to thrive in the world. Connection is my job. Now, granted, there's a balance here. We can't be the performing monkey all the time, but we have to be willing to meet students where they are, right? We have to be willing to meet students where they are. And if that means I have to set foot in their world and walk around in a little bit, I'm willing to do that. You know, they come into my classroom every day. They learn the things that I tell them to do. They set foot in my world every single day. If I can connect with them where they live, it feels like I'm meeting them halfway. You know, I'm moving towards their direction, towards their world. In school, they're used to moving toward where the teacher is. But when the teacher moves towards their world, it's a breath of fresh air. I feel like it's the least that I can do. Now, after I started to come to terms with that part of my job, not necessarily to entertain, but to connect, I started wondering about something else. Is flipping the attention switch something teachers are supposed to do? Like, is this real teaching? Is there research or anything to back this up? It turns out that there is. For one, when we try to flip the attention switch, get the electricity flowing, by definition, we're creating a positive expectation for learning. We're creating a positive environment based on what the students view as positive. And that works, according to research in Sean Acor's best-selling book, The Happiness Advantage. He reports that we humans are 31% more productive when our mood, our emotional state is positive. 31% more productive when we're positive. Acor writes, our brains are literally hardwired to perform at their best, not when they're at negative, not when they're at neutral, but when they're at positive. Let's break that down. We want our students to perform at their best, and we want to teach in ways that are best suited for how the brain learns, right? Our brains are literally hardwired to perform at their best when they're at positive. Research and statistics in ACOR's book back this up. For instance, doctors come to accurate diagnoses 19% faster and demonstrate more intelligence and creativity when they're in a positive mood, 19% faster. Optimistic salespeople outsell their pessimistic counterparts by 56%. 
and in his work with students at Harvard, Acor saw the profound impact a positive brain had on those students' learning. I saw it with my students by flipping the attention switch. And you can see it too. Now, maybe we can't build our entire curriculum around the power of positive brain, but it can have a significant impact in what we do. Let's take a turn for the nerdy and look at a neuroscience study. Now, don't worry. I promise I'll make this quick and interesting, okay? This one study found that emotional events, anything tied to strong emotion like joy, happiness, even sadness, anger, frustration, emotional events often attain a privileged status in memory. Privileged status in memory. If your memory was a set of index cards, emotions put that memory at the top of the stack. Connect happiness to a memory, top of the stack. Anger, frustration, top of the stack. Emotions tell your brain what's important. From the moment your brain attempts to store something new in memory all the way to retrieval from long-term memory. Emotions bring learning back to the top of the stack of memories. Emotions are important. And this last bit of research has to do with a filter in students' brains, really a filter in all of our brains, that fights against us when we don't flip the attention switch. It's called the Reticular Activating System, or the RAS, Reticular Activating System. You sound really smart whenever you say it. Do you want to say it? Just say it wherever you are, right, right out loud. Okay, ready? Reticular Activating System. Pretty cool, right? Do you feel just a little bit smarter having said that? Our brains get flooded with stimuli all the time from our senses. And if our brain tried to process all of those stimuli from all of those senses, it would just overwork itself. And so we have the reticular activating system to act as a filter of sorts. It's kind of like when movie stars go out in public. <laughs> go with me on this, okay? They get overcome by a mob of screaming fans looking for autographs and pictures. So what do the movie stars do? They hire a bodyguard, someone to keep the mob out so they can live their lives. The reticular activating system is the brain's bodyguard. It blocks out stimuli that it thinks is unimportant so the brain can do its work. Have you ever bought a new car? Or at least a new car to you, and suddenly you're driving down the car and you start noticing all of these cars that look like yours. You're driving along and you're going, wow, look at that, that car is just like mine. There's another one that's just like mine. Oh my goodness, it's like there's a big sale going on at the car dealership on my exact car. Where did all of these cars come from? Have you ever felt that way before? Are there really more cars just like yours out on the road? No. That's actually the RAS at work in your brain. It had filter out all of those other cars because they were deemed unimportant. I'm sorry, yeah, they were deemed unimportant. At least until you bought one. Then they mattered and the RAS let them through. The RAS is at work in your students' brains every single day. If it thinks what the teacher is saying or doing is irrelevant, it's likely to filter you out. Unless, of course, you're not irrelevant. See, when you connect what you're teaching to something important to students, Snapchat, TikTok, Among Us, sports, theater, anything, whatever's important to them. It's like slipping the brain's bodyguard a 20 so you can slip through the doors and suddenly the attention switch is on. So the attention switch is not about entertainment. It's about connection, right? How can you connect with your students? Connect them to content, connect the dots. It's also backed by real teaching, or it is also real teaching, backed by research and cognitive science. Now, finding ideas. This is where it gets tricky. Finding ideas that will flip the attention switch. 
sometimes finding ideas can be easy. Sometimes you just hear students talking and the excitement is impossible to miss. And immediately you're like, I know exactly how that can fit in class. But sometimes those switch flipping ideas aren't staring you in the face and you have to go searching for them on your own. So where do you find them? How do you know what will catch someone's attention, catch your student's attention and flip the attention switch? For me, there's not just one place. I don't know about you, but I try to keep my teacher antenna up all the time. Thankfully, there's this one website that's been delivering us those attention grabbing ideas for more than a decade. And it's called YouTube. It's kind of a microcosm of what's popular in the moment. It's the second biggest search engine in the world. And every minute, YouTubers are uploading more than 500 hours of video. And as soon as the YouTube's algorithm starts to notice that your video is getting attention, clicks, views, likes, comments, it starts spreading that video far and wide. And more and more people find it. And that's called a trending video, right? The videos that trend show us where the public psyche is, almost down to the hour. I'm always fascinated to see what people love to watch on YouTube. For me, it's like a great big social experiment to show our own personal weirdness. So here's what I'd like you to do. Uh, in the chat, I'd love for you to tell all of us what you like to watch on YouTube. What do you watch on YouTube? What kinds of videos? You know, uh, what specific YouTubers? What specific YouTube channels? Like, what kinds of stuff do you love to watch on YouTube? I'm going to keep an eye on those comments, but I'm going to give you a second as those comments are coming in. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what we watch at our house. So for instance, there's this one uh, YouTube channel called Dude Perfect. I don't know if you've heard of Dude Perfect before. It's these five guys. They started out doing sports trick shots. And, um, you know, we, we just continually watched them. We tried some of the stuff and then they evolved to create some different content. I think we've seen all of their videos like 20 times. There's another one called, there's a guy called Mark Rober who was an engineer at NASA. And now he does all of these outlandish um, science experiments. And he shows you how the science experiments work. Like for once, um, he created a pool full of jello in his backyard. And he even told us um, that there, were, there was just a few weeks out of the year where the air temperature and the ground temperature were perfect so that it could make it work. So anyway, those are just a couple. We watch a lot of Mr. Beast these days, too. <laughs> I think that one's, that one's getting pretty, pretty widespread. So um, Marcus, who are, or whoever's running the show here, could you just start throwing some of the comments on? We'll just kind of do them rapid fire, and I'll just read a couple of them off just so we can... Um, take a look at what some of the things are that, that people do. Like, here's one. I watch cooking channels, even though I never make anything like what I see. Hey, no shame in that. It's like entertainment, right? What's another one? I also ask my 14 and 19 year old what or who they watch and to share with me videos that they watch. Lisa Marie, yes, that's a great idea. And that, I mean, that's one way for us to stay relevant to know what's going on, right? Let's do a few more. The behavior panel. I've not heard of this one explains human behavior in interviews and court cases. That's fascinating. With all of the like cognitive science I've been talking about, you know, you know that I'd probably be interested in that. <laughs> More TikTok than YouTube, crafting, politics, comedy. I tell you what, I just used YouTube because it's been the behemoth over the last decade plus. I think TikTok fits with all of this stuff too. Let's do one more. Music parodies for English language acquisition. I love this as a world language teacher myself. I upload the video to Canvas and make a comprehension quiz. A Holderness family, yes, has great current event parodies. Ah, oh, this is fantastic. These were, these were really good. This is exactly, exactly what I was looking for. So the more that you study YouTube, you start to notice something about trending videos. They often are not completely never before seen unique snowflakes, right? YouTubers create and recreate certain types of videos, certain genres of videos. 
that you see over and over and over again. And most of the time, they aren't trying to invent something brand new. They reuse these popular styles of videos over and over and over again because they know they've been popular before. So they know that they're likely to be popular again. For example, on YouTube, you can tell I've been doing lots of research on YouTube. We can call it research. I'm just really watching stuff on YouTube. <laughs> but you're likely to find lots of top 10 list videos, product reviews, tutorials. There's a good chance that your students have seen these types of videos too. And thankfully, with all of these, they can be repurposed in some, into some really interesting learning activities in the classroom. Now, there's one type of video on YouTube in particular that has a ton of potential for the classroom. And I want to do a little deep dive on it for just a second. And that type of video is the unboxing video. Have you ever watched one of these? Tell us in the comments if you've ever watched an unboxing video. And if so, what type? Because there's tons of them. And in these videos, if you've never watched an unboxing video before, YouTubers record themselves opening something they boxed or, or they just bought or received in the mail. They unbox cell phones, makeup, sneakers, toys, subscription boxes. And as they open up the boxes to reveal to us what inside, what's inside, we get to see their reactions to it, their opinions of what they're getting. And one of the first times I saw an unboxing video, two thoughts went through my mind. The first was this, wow, people actually watch these? Like, what does this say about the future of humanity? I mean, we're watching a video of someone opening their mail. But the second thought I had, I can't stop watching this thing. These unboxing videos could be a pretty cool way for students to show what they know. They could actually serve as a demonstration of learning, like a formative assessment, if you will. Have you ever thought about that? Let me show you what I mean. So to demonstrate, I have a box. And right here, right now, I'm going to do an unboxing video for you. Now, as I unbox it, put on your teacher hat and think about how this works as an academic task and how it can be customized to what you teach. Can we go full screen with my video? All right. I'm gonna wait just a second, see if we can go full. Can we go full screen with my video? If not, I'll just keep moving. Okay, there's full screen with the slides. We're getting close. I really should have told him ahead of time that I was gonna ask him to do this. <laughs> if not, that's okay. I think it's the button on the far left. Going once, ha ha, there we go. All right, we got it. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Here's our, our um, YouTube unboxing video. In three, two, one, go. Oh my goodness, you're never gonna believe what I just got in the mail. I just got this box and it's a box to me, from me, from the 80s. I am so fascinated to see what's inside of this box. I don't know how they got this box to me. I mean, if you look at the label, it's got my current address and my old address when I was, in, when I was you know, a kid back in the 80s. I am so fascinated to see what's inside this box. So let's take a look. Oh my goodness, there's some great stuff inside of this. Now, one of the first things that I see right up here at the top is a letter. So I'm gonna open this up. This letter would be a great way to provide context for the box without tying it to something in the box. The letter says, Dear Matt, here's a box to help you remember where you came from and your roots. Because when you know where you've been, you know where you need to go. All right, very good. All right, let's see what's inside this box. Oh my goodness, this is so good. Do you remember the days when we used to not save files to the cloud and we used to save them to these? Do you remember that? Or even the bigger, more floppy ones? And if you had one really big file, you had to span it across a whole bunch of these disks, right? How about this? Do you remember when we used to not listen to music on our phones? And we used to listen to music with these, complete with the antenna. And there's the tuning knob too. Do you remember the tuning knob? See, 
I used to live outside of the big city, but I like the big city radio stations. And man, if I was going to get that thing in, I had to extend that antenna as far as it would go. And you had to tune that tuning knob down to like the half millimeter. <laughs> like you had to get it just right. Kids these days will never know. Do you remember when we used to not take pictures with our phones? And we used to take pictures with cameras instead. Do you remember this? And if you took a picture, you had no idea if it was a good picture or not, because there's nothing to show you what a picture looks like on film until you develop it. One hour developing was a glorious thing if you could afford it. Do you remember when our smartphones were not so smart? Do you remember texting on these things, the T9 texting? Like, if I wanted to put a Z into a text message, I had to hit that 9 key four times. Did you ever see anybody who was really good at that kind of text messaging? Their thumbs are just, like, flying all over the place. I was talking to a guy once while he was texting. He's, like, watching me. I'm trying to talk to him, and I go, are you even paying attention to me? And he's going, mm-hmm. Thumbs still flying like crazy. So there you go. So as I wrap this YouTube video up, I have a question for you in the comments. Tell me, if you were going to send a video from the 80s, or if you weren't alive in the 80s, if you're going to send a video for, or you're going to send a box, if you're going to send a box from your childhood or the 80s, what would you include in it that wasn't in my box? Like, comment, and subscribe. And that's the end of the video. That's where it would end. So two things here. Number one, I did just ask you a question, right? If you were going to do a box from the 80s like mine, what would you include in it? Type that into the comments. We're going to have a lot of fun with that, okay? But then secondly, can you start to see where this could go in the classroom? If we take our student hat off and put our teacher hat on, we start to think of this as a learning activity. Like, what could that look like, you know? Tell me what some of your initial thoughts are here in the, uh, in the comments. And then if we can throw some of those um, 80s things up on the screen, that would be super cool if we can see any. Um, MTV used to show real music videos. Yes, Lisa, this is true. Contrary to popular belief. I love that one. That's great. Carbon paper to edit mistakes on a typewriter. Oh, my goodness. And how about the, uh, the like, whiteout strip that you had on the typewriter? That was a typewriter innovation where you could hit the, like, backspace key and you could erase. My live aid concert book. Oh, my goodness. There's the big one right there. Aquanet hairspray. Somebody always mentions Aquanet hairspray. Thriller album cover. Oh, that's a good one, too. Let's do two more. Rubik's Cube. Absolutely a Rubik's Cube. And then one more, vinyl. Vinyl disc. That might have even gone back like before the 80s. Eight track tapes too, yes. Oh my goodness, these are so good. I saw somebody up above um, talking about uh, pagers. Parachute pants. <laughs> oh, these are so good. I love all of them. This is fantastic. Okay, so let's think about this as like a, uh, as a teaching activity. How could you potentially use this as a, you know, as a lesson, as an activity. So um, keep kind of like chatting about that in the comments. Um, I'm going to get back to uh, some of the stuff I was talking about, but um, let's just kind of brainstorm together. And I mean, I've got some ideas that I can share with you too, because um, I'm kind of passionate about this idea as well. So to get my clicker to go again. There we go. Okay. So the big question, of course, is could the unboxing video be used as an activity in the classroom? I don't know about you, but I think absolutely. Some examples. Students could unbox a package sent from one character to another in a novel. They could unbox a package sent to your students present day from someone in history. Students could unbox the items necessary for a science lab or an art project or a foods lab to try to guess what, they're, what you're making. What else could we do? Students could box up things that represented their biggest accomplishments and lessons learned at the end of the year. 
then students could box up a care package for students taking a class next year with tips and strategies. Or they could send a package to themselves in the past with life advice. Or students could create a box about themselves. This is great for the beginning of the year. And unbox it for the class to introduce themselves at the beginning of the school year. And the details are the way that students can show you how much they've learned. For example, they can discuss who's the audience. If they're recording this like a YouTuber would or a TikToker or a Twitch streamer, who's watching the video? Who is sending the box and who is receiving it and why? Is there anything significant or telling on the outside of the box? Like with my box, I showed you the mailing label, right? What's in the box and why did the sender include it? Now, throughout all of this, the student is constantly answering this one question to make sure that this stays as a good academic task. How does this show what I've learned? If they constantly ask themselves, how does this show what I've learned, they'll stay on point. Now, what if you don't have items to include in the box? Or what if you don't want students bringing valuable items to school? Maybe they could record them as videos at home. Or maybe they could draw and print out pictures of items that they would include. What if they took pictures of the things that they would put in their box and stuck those pictures in a Wakelet collection and then described those pictures down below? Now, if students recorded these in a YouTube-style video, how would they even do it? Of course, there's Flipgrid, a free video response program that lets students record short video clips and submit them. Now, Flipgrid's camera and its video editing capabilities make it feel like YouTube or even TikTok for the classroom. And of course, it's free. You also have free screen recording tools like Screencastify or Loom that let you record your screen or your webcam. And of course, if students do any of these recordings and you get a link to them, you know where you can stick that link? In a Wakelet collection so that you have all of those student unboxing videos all together in one place. Or what if they didn't even use technology at all? What if students unboxed their boxes live in a small group? What if students planned out how they would do an unboxing as a prompt for a written activity? And again, go find pictures of what you would put in it and type little descriptions in a Wakelet collection. These unboxing videos don't feel like a failure to humanity like they did before, at least to me anyway. Now, if you've been loving all of the practical ideas that you can use in class right away and you'd like to get your hands on some more, even the ones I've shown you in this presentation, I have something for you. It's this free ebook called the, the Attention Switch Student Engagement Pack. It's full of templates that you can copy and assign to students tomorrow plus planning guides and even more resources to help you flip the attention switch. In the same place, you can get three more free eBooks full of ideas, templates, tutorials, classroom ideas. Did I mention they're free? Because they're free. Now, if you're looking at all of this stuff and you're thinking, wow, that is some great stuff. I wonder where I can get that stuff. <laughs> I promise this is a real thing. So if you go to getmatstuff.com and just type in your email address, you can get all of those free eBooks, the Attention Switch Student Engagement Pack, and you'll also be signed up for my email list where I share lots of ideas like these in your inbox every single week. So we can find ways to keep those attention switches turned on in lots of places. We can flip the attention switch with things students talk about. You can flip the attention switch by finding what's trending, you know, the ideas that are popular in spaces that your students love. Lots of places to find ideas. But it's not foolproof. It's definitely not foolproof. Just because we want to flip the attention switch for our students doesn't mean it's going to work out the way that we envision. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've tried to do something cool to flip my students' attention switches and I didn't even get a flicker of light. I could tell you about the cool activity where we were going to make infographics on the computers 
and the app moved so slowly, it took my students 15 minutes just to add a couple of pictures to their projects. This one was so bad that the students used the name of that dreadfully slow app as a way to tease me for the rest of the year. Thankfully, that app does not exist anymore. I could tell you about the cool Skype call that I set up with a class in a Spanish-speaking country to talk to my kids in the US. And the call never connected because I forgot to get Skype unblocked in our school. Those are just a couple of the big ones. For each story of a big flop, there were dozens of minor flops that led to glazed over eyes of my students, heads down on their desks, or even sneaky text message conversations under their desks. See, we get a picture in our minds of what things could look like, but the results are a far cry from what we pictured. It's kind of like those Pinterest fails. Have you ever seen Pinterest fails before? Do you know what I'm talking about, Pinterest fails? It's like when someone tries to recreate picture-perfect sugar cookies or crafts, and they end up looking like a four-year-old made them. Oh, look, rubber ducky cupcakes. Those would be so much fun. We got to try those. <laughs> Nailed it. Oh, Cookie Monster Cupcakes. Those are cute. Look, he's got the little cookie in his mouth. Oh, I've totally got to try that. Nailed it. Oh my goodness. It's the Betty Crocker train cake. Oh, my kids would love this so much. This is gonna be so much fun. Nailed it. <laughs> See, there's a side of these Pinterest fails that we never hear about. We never hear about the struggle that the creator went through, right? I mean, they didn't want to make poorly constructed Cookie Monster cupcakes. Nobody sets out to make any of those pictures on the bottom. Those creators had the Pinterest perfect version in mind when they bought the ingredients and they got started. And eventually, perfect version in their mind just didn't line up to their results. And at some point they had to look at it and go, this is bad. <laughs> this doesn't look like the ones on Pinterest at all. They set a standard, those Cookie Monster cupcakes, and they just didn't reach those expectations. And when we don't reach our expectations, it's natural for us to try to explain it. And if you're like me, the way I explain it many times is by looking at myself and wondering if maybe, just maybe, I'm just not cut out for this kind of thing. I know, I know. We're, we're just talking about Cookie Monster cupcakes here. But when you try to flip the attention switch for your students, chances are you'll fall short of your expectations too, just, just like I did. Here's what we will never know about those Cookie Monster cupcakes, especially the ones on the left. We will never know how many times it took to make them Pinterest perfect. We'll never know how many cupcakes ended up in the trash. We have no idea how many years the baker spent perfecting her cupcakes and how many times she doubted her skills and wanted to quit. It's not fair to compare those cupcakes on the right on their first try to those cupcakes on the left with years of skill and unlimited time and resources. And in the classroom, when it comes to our best attempts to flip the attention switch, it's even more unfair to compare our first tries to our unrealistic expectations. Everybody struggles. Give yourself some grace, learn from it, and try again. So by now, I hope you have a pretty clear idea of what the attention switch is. Now, all of this isn't just to get you excited about doing unboxing videos in your classroom, right? I mean, if every teacher watching this just showed up and did an unboxing video activity on class, uh, first time you see them again, and those students have like multiple unboxing videos to do that day, they would get pretty suspicious, wouldn't they? No, all of this today, the simple Vine vocabulary videos, the YouTube unboxing idea, they show you a line of thinking. This is a line of thinking. It's a way to think differently about the things that students love. 
instead of putting a wall between those things in the classroom, they can coexist. We can put what students love and the learning together. And we must. We have important things to pass along to these students that we are entrusted with. And we can't do that without attention. And attention is a hard thing to get these days. So hard that advertisers started placing ads by the toilet so we'd pay attention. And we still didn't pay attention. Attention is hard to get. YouTubers have figured part of it out. If an idea already exists out there that captures attention, we can use it, repurpose it, to get the attention that we need. The attention we need to teach our students those valuable lessons that we must teach them to ensure the future world that we envision. We must do it. And the attention is going to help. All of us. We all have it in us to flip the attention switch. Don't let your own insecurities convince you to give up. Don't let that little voice convince you that you're just not cut out for this or that your first attempt is enough reason to never try again. Just like your students, you'll improve little by little. It's like what Maya Angelou said. She said, I did then what I knew how to do. Now that I know better, I do better. The road to engaging your students is a tricky, imprecise, frustrating one. But it's important and meaningful and rewarding. Whether you know how to or not, try. Try to turn that attention switch on. And in the end, you'll have a classroom that's way more effective than an advertisement in a toilet stall. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks for being here and for being a part of this stream. Hope you enjoyed it. Well, um, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Certainly puts Thanks a lot of much. things into perspective for me and I'm sure for everybody here, the, the innovation that you shared, I'm sure will offer a lot of value. And I'm sure it's quite challenging as well to, to stay up to date with all that's going on in the lives of students. There's so many apps and so many different things for, um, for students to get distracted by or to get sucked into. So um, I think these kind of uh, methods for speaking a student's language is, is really insightful. Um, and, and yeah, I'm sure everyone in the, in the chat I uh, really, really enjoyed the, the positivity that was being shared by people watching. Thank you so much for, for all the brilliant messages. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much time uh, right now. So if you do want to ask questions or have any um, inquiries for Matt, I'm sure uh, he'd be happy to hear from you on his uh, social media channels. Uh, and I definitely encourage everyone to check out all the resources that were shared today in the collection and um, that we'll drop into the chat and share out after the, the session as well. Um, but uh, Matt, do you have any closing words before we finish up today's session? Uh, no, I mean, if uh, people want to kind of stick with me and get more ideas, you know, co a constant drip of ideas every week, you know, that email newsletter that you can get on at getmattstuff.com is the best way to stay plugged in. So if you want to continually get more of that stuff, that's the best thing. But uh, really, I appreciate you. And the fact that you all are here and willing to get ideas to support your students to help them learn better, like... You are what the world needs right now. So thank you so much for being a part of this. I totally agree. Yeah, from me, thank you very much to everybody for jo that joined the session today. And thank you so much, Matt, for, for presenting. Really My interesting pleasure. session. And we'll see you all next time. Take care.